Earlier this week, Apple announced probably its biggest software update ever with loads of new features across its entire product lineup. iOS was upgraded with new customizations and new UI changes. There's new privacy controls, texting updates, along with a host of new app features. iPadOS and macOS got some pretty great new features as well, but probably the biggest story out of this whole event was all the new AI or Apple intelligence features. Apple mentioned that phrase around 60 times during the event, and because this is such a significant update across the lineup, I wanna go over the important bits of what Apple announced and what that likely means for most people. So if you wanna see what you can look forward to over the next year with these updates with 100% less parkour than the Apple event, stick around and let's get into it. Hey everyone, Kyle Erickson here. Apple announced a boatload of stuff this year at WWDC, so much so that I took like 16 pages of notes. So for the sake of efficiency, let's just dive right into what's important here. iOS is getting a lot more customizable with new icon themes that can go into a dark or tinted mode. You can adjust the sizing and place them wherever you'd like now. So in that sense, Things are at least somewhat similar to Android, which I'm all for. Customization also extends to the lock screen where you can swap out the controls in the bottom corners to things other than the camera and the flashlight, and in the control center where you can now swipe through different spaces within control center and add or customize controls that are displayed on each panel. I also noticed that the UI within here is a bit different, especially when you drill down into things like connectivity. And in general, you'll notice some UI tweaks within the native Apple apps like settings and photos. The photos app has new categories that group together different people and trips that you've gone on, all of which you can customize and filter out things like screenshots. There's also a host of new privacy features. You can now press and hold down on apps to require face ID or a passcode to unlock them. And there is a bunch of other options within those menus at times, depending on the app. And you've also got a hidden apps folder where you can keep all your deepest, darkest secrets safe. There's a new passwords app that's essentially just like what Keychain Access is, but they've developed it into its own app that you can now access across all Apple platforms or even Windows for that matter. And you can share that with your family or friends as well. That cross-platform functionality is likely enough for a lot of people to move away from third-party password managers, including myself. I think there's a level of comfort or security you get with Apple doing that that you just don't always have with other companies. So it's definitely a welcome addition. Now, privacy was not only limited to software, but you can now limit access to your Bluetooth devices and certain apps, which I thought was really neat and something that I've never seen before. And in regards to Bluetooth devices, Apple also brought game mode from macOS to iOS, which reduces the latency of external accessories like AirPods and controllers and limits background tasks to provide a better overall gaming experience. They also added some neat gestures with AirPods so you can accept and decline calls with head nods and respond to Siri, which is kind of interesting. iMessage got a couple of new features as well. You can now schedule messages, which I'm a huge fan of having family and friends that live on the other side of the country. You can now add text effects to messages and there's just a lot more customization options with things like tap backs, if you want us to like different emojis or stickers. That's about as far as I've got personally just playing around in the beta, but there's a bunch of stuff that was in the event that just isn't in here yet, which is to be expected given this is the first developer beta and we might not see that stuff for a while yet. Once things are fleshed out a little bit more and we start getting into the public betas, I usually try and do videos for each operating system, both of the features that Apple brought up in the keynote and some things that they didn't. So if you wanna check those out, Make sure that you're subscribed and I'll put those up when things are built out a little bit more. I'd say these are just regular things for the most part that we're used to seeing at these events and they aren't super disruptive to how anyone is gonna use their devices. But where it gets exciting is when we get into the more predictive or AI side of things. The AI stuff I'm gonna get into in a bit, but with iOS specifically, we can start to see that creep in with email functionality. Inside the mail app, we'll eventually get categories, much in the same way that we do with Gmail, where things are grouped into our primary inbox that has emails from people that you know or 
time sensitive messages. And then there's also groups like transactions, updates for things like newsletters and social and promotions as well. It'll also bring together all your emails from one organization. The example Apple gave, I believe, was putting together all your flight information where at a glance you can see a summary of what each message looks like. And I think just in general, the more that mail can do this stuff automatically, the better, especially for someone like me who isn't the greatest at organizing my inbox. iOS 18 has updates to Apple Pay as well, where they've introduced tap to cash to exchange Apple Cash between users without sharing personal information, which looks very similar to name drop from last year's keynote. We don't get Apple Cash here in Canada, so it's not something that I can really say a ton about other than it looks cool, but in a nutshell, these are the things that stood out that were specific to iOS. iPadOS has got a lot of the same updates, given that it basically runs iOS under the hood. There's some minor updates like the floating tab bar available on some apps, but things get a little more exciting with SharePlay this year, where you can draw on the screen when screen sharing or request to remotely control another person's iPad. That's probably useful for those of us who have to do tech support over the phone for a family member. I'm not sure how likely it is that you'll escape that entirely, given that the person who needs support probably doesn't know how to do that either. The biggest feature in iPadOS though, in my opinion, and frankly one of the most surprising in this whole event, was the introduction of the calculator app. Well, not so much the calculator itself, which is just a calculator, but some of the stuff surrounding it. There's a new feature called Math Notes, where you can use the Apple Pencil to write down notes and the iPad will solve the problems for you with live results in your own handwriting. This is supposed to work not only with basic math, but with advanced physics as well. And the funny thing about this is, literally minutes before the keynote started, I was sketching down in a notebook, figuring out dimensions for some 3D prints that I was working on, so... For myself, I think that I'll end up using this quite a bit. iPadOS will now also try and improve your handwriting in notes with SmartScript, which will give you more options for moving things around and formatting your writing. And other than that, there's not a whole lot that's new, just specific to iPadOS. I know a lot of folks were buying the M4 iPad Pro on potential, and hoping to see all these new features that would take advantage of the M4 in all these new ways, and if that was you, I'm not sure how happy you're going to be with this update. That's one of the reasons why I usually never buy anything based on potential and only what's available at the time of release, because you just never know when a feature or an update is going to come. But anyway, let's move on to macOS Sequoia. Again, you're going to get some of the same features there as well with things like messages and math notes, but one of the coolest things in my opinion is the new continuity feature where you can mirror your iPhone screen and access it as if you were on your phone. If you are mirroring your iPhone, your phone notifications will appear on your Mac, your audio will also transfer over, and you can transfer over files by dragging them from your Mac to your iPhone, which I think will be super handy to just have sitting up on your screen rather than having to pick up your phone each time. macOS will now have native window snapping, which I am curious about to someone who's had to use apps like Magnet for years to achieve the same functionality. As a Windows defector, that was something that I always thought was missing on Mac, so it's nice to see that finally show up. Apple also spent a lot of time going over new things in Safari, like highlights that use machine learning to highlight important information or content summaries. You would access that where the reader currently is in Safari, and that's also been redesigned. And you'll also get information about places, people, or media within the corresponding actions or links right inside there. There's now a viewer that detects videos on a page and can blow them up or activate picture in picture by clicking away from them, which kind of reminds me of the picture in picture functionality that Firefox uses. This is just much more integrated into macOS, and I think that's probably the most useful change in Safari that I'd end up using out of these. The last thing that they really talked about with macOS, and I guess all their devices for that matter, was gaming, where it seems like Apple is really pushing to make it known that all their devices can play modern games. I don't know if anyone else notices this, but for the past year or two, they always seem to default to talking about Death Stranding Director's Cut for some reason. That game isn't exactly new, so I'm not sure that that's what I'd choose in the same sentence as Cutting Edge, but regardless, they did bring out the VP of Ubisoft to talk about new games that were coming to Apple, and they seem to really focus on the APIs and toolkits for developers for making games, so there does seem to be a pretty big push there, which I thought was interesting. I did want to just briefly touch on Vision OS and Watch OS before we get into the most important stuff. These were probably the least notable things at the event, with Vision OS 2 getting some new gestures and spatial photo features, but 
They just seem to want to focus on getting new developers on board and trying to make apps for Vision Pro, which I think makes sense given its current state. WatchOS is getting some new health features like training load for monitoring workout information. Likewise, the fitness app has new metrics available. You can now pause your ring tracking and there's a new vitals feature to monitor more health metrics for when you sleep. And that's supposed to provide more insights into your overall health. Outside of that, live activities were added to the watch along with dictation and a new photos watch face. So you do get some useful stuff, but there's just a lot less substance than everything else here. Going through all these OS updates, Apple went through about 60% of the keynote without really referencing AI specifically at all, but from then on out, it was all Apple intelligence. Apple intelligence is just what they've branded their own flavor of AI, and I think one of the biggest things they did with this was the initial focus on context and privacy. I found the privacy side of things the most interesting, because we haven't really seen any of these other companies focus on it in the same way, where Apple says that they're basically going to localize any processing with your queries or prompts so that they're going to be on device, and if they end up needing to go outside of that, the OS will reach to something called private cloud to get whatever it needs. Private cloud is supposed to be comprised of Apple Silicon based servers, and its only intended use is to complete or fulfill whatever request is being made. And nothing is supposed to be stored or logged on those servers or be accessible by Apple. Apple released a really dry, boring white paper on how all that stuff works, and I think that's a pretty good place to start to get folks on board. And it seems to be on brand for Apple, and as far as the contextual stuff, I think that's likely what most people are going to be the most excited about, especially with Siri. Siri will now be able to contextually understand voice commands, so the example Apple gave was asking for the weather for a specific location, showing it, and then telling Siri to create an event for a hike there at 10am, with their referencing the location of the last command. They also showcased how you can fumble with your words a bit and backtrack or correct yourself without having to start the prompt or the voice command over, where Siri will still be able to understand what you mean, and honestly, I'll just be excited if Siri can understand what I want in the first place, so that alone will be a huge step forward. But wait, there's more. Siri will now be able to interact with your hardware a lot more effectively, understanding more about the operating system and your apps, and be able to answer questions and perform commands for specific apps that are beyond what's pre-programmed in, and supposedly will understand information even if the exact feature isn't known. It'll also be able to do things like enhance photos, add content to notes, or cross-communicate between apps to take photos and put them into notes, and take things contextually from past events or documents and bring forward relevant information pertaining to it just by asking without being too overly specific. So in general, a pretty huge overhaul if everything works out this good, and on top of that, You'll now be able to use your voice or text to communicate with Siri at any given point, so it's a lot more flexible in that sense as well. Apple also showed off a bunch of other AI features that you're probably used to seeing at this point if you've been paying attention to all these other LLM services in the last couple of years, where it'll write emails or documents for you, suggest wording and tone, along with summarization features and smart reply suggestions. That was closely tied to things like email management, where not only could you do things with the copy in your emails, but there's this whole predictive analysis being done where, like I said earlier talking about the mail app, you're provided with snippets of text or summaries of the emails without opening them and relevant or important information like upcoming events. Something similar is supposed to happen with notifications, showing priority information and summaries, and anything that they can do to make notifications less clunky, I'm all for, because I do think that is one of the current weak points in all of this software. Another thing Apple focused on with AI was image generation in a number of places, but unlike a lot of other companies, they seem to distance themselves more from the real life image features outside of things like removing objects or people from your images, which iOS will have, but they try to keep things a lot more playful and away from the more controversial side of AI image production. You'll now be able to generate your own emojis with Genmoji where 
It'll either generate something unique based on a description you provide or ones that resemble your contacts. I'm not sure how many of your contacts are gonna like having random emojis generated of them, but it is there nonetheless. Outside that, they added Image Playground to generate images that you can use in a standalone app or inside some apps like Messages or Freeform that can also generate images based on people you know or your own personal context. There's also the new image wand feature that you can use inside of notes where you can circle empty areas or rough sketches and have Image Playground analyze that image or the surrounding notes and it'll give you suggestions to replace it with a generated image. Search is also going to be enhanced in the Photos app where you'll be able to search for very specific things and be provided with better results. And from my understanding, you'll also be able to do things like make slideshows or videos based on what you put in, which is kind of cool, I guess. Although I'm not sure that I'd ever use something like that. Finally, the last thing that they went over was the integration with ChatGPT, where if you ask Siri something like suggestions for recipes or you're reaching for something that it can't answer, but ChatGPT possibly can, it'll ask you if you'd like to search with ChatGPT and provide you with some results there. I think the important thing to note here is all this talk about Apple servers and private cloud probably goes out the window to some extent when you make these queries. I know Apple says that you don't need to create an account and all that information is not logged, but I'm assuming that all of that still needs to travel through OpenAI servers and probably works a little bit different than all of this other AI stuff, but it's still a neat integration regardless. You can now use it for asking questions about images, helping write documents within Mac apps, and there's supposedly some advanced features if you subscribe to ChatGPT Plus that they never really went over, but I am curious to know how that factors in there. Having said that, I'm a lot more excited for all this contextual stuff and Siri being able to actually understand me and do more things on my phone, which I think was kind of what the dream was when it was initially introduced all the way back on the iPhone 4S. This has the potential to really enhance everyone's experience in their devices and make things a lot more seamless, which I guess is true of most of the events and the features that are announced, but this just seems like a much bigger step than usual. It's still up in the air on how good a lot of this will work and when a lot of it will actually show up in iOS 18, but it should make for a pretty interesting year. I really want to know what everyone else is most excited for this year, especially when some of this stuff gets added to the beta and I test it out and make videos going through some of the features. It's always nice to know what to spend more time on and go over, so please drop a comment down below and let me know what you like the most about these updates. That's all I have for you today. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, feel free to hit that like button. If you'd like to see more tech related content or help me create a smart thermostat that tells weather jokes while adjusting the temperature. Please subscribe. Thank you so much for watching and I will see you in the next upload.